Okay. Hello, good evening. I'm not Greg Roschke, as you can see. I'm Jill Sexton, Associate Director for the Digital Library at NC State. Greg, was um, his flight was canceled uh, with the snow in Raleigh, and so um, I'm a stand-in, so please bear with me. I saw this presentation about 30 minutes ago, <laughs> um, so I'll be talking through his parts of it, but um, you're luckily in great hands. My colleague, Jason evans Growth is going to do the bulk of the talking about the work that he's done in the libraries, and, um, and he's seen this presentation before. So. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the library as a platform, technology, and the transformed library's impact on teaching and learning. Um, at NC State, we believe that the transformation of library spaces and the associated, associated technologies um, provide significant opportunities to fundamentally engage and foster creative models of teaching and learning. A combination of high technology spaces, flexible learning environments, and library expertise that we have at NC State um, has fostered an experiential learning environment that faculty and students have leveraged to enhance the educational experience. Uh, this session will explore several examples of experiential learning, creative uses of high technology spaces, uh, and the important con combination of ingredients that we use to maximize the experiential learning potential of new library spaces, which repositions our library as a fundament fundamental difference maker um, in the educational environment provided by colleges and universities. Um, one of the nice quotes that kind of encapsulates this is from one of our faculty members in the English department, Paul Fife, um, who um, in talking about the libraries has said that the libraries has been more than a service provider, even more than a collaborator and partner. They've really expanded his idea of the possible. And so what follows is a brief story of how um, we moved from being a, considered a service provider to an expander of the possible on our campus. So as delivery of core curriculum and foundational learning increasingly moves online and in, an a, a, and, and in asynchronous environments, the libraries become a platform for deeper learning and a lead distinguishing element of the educational experience for the university. It's become a difference maker in why students choose to come to NC State to build their futures and how they actively learn while they're, at, while they're here. So the experiential library is a library where the full suite of a college or university's experiential and active learning offerings are available for the entire community and the next generation of experiential learning is pioneered for faculty and students. Today we know that things like maker spaces, high technology immersive environments, and virtual reality are part of active learning environments. Additional partnerships can add key experiential offerings like things like undergraduate research, um, the writing centers, career counseling, and tutoring services. Uh, in the future, libraries should incorporate active learning classrooms embedded into library spaces and create more environments for the exploration of new technologies like virtual and augmented reality. You'll see some examples of our, our work in this area um, coming up next. Um, things like student scholarships and fellowships funded by private support will help the library attract highly skilled students and promote robust peer learning uh, uh, networks, uh, and again, which we'll talk about um, further on in the, pr in the presentation. Partnerships with and outreach to faculty by expert librarians will expand the volume and nature of how faculty and students use the library. Um, and library-provided experiential learning spaces and services will be embedded into the curriculum at all phases in every college. This is, a, a, obviously, this is um, Greg's aspiration, sorry. <laughs> um, so we believe that the library needs to be the centerpiece for active and collaborative learning spaces on campus. Some of the opportunities that we can uh, gain when we, when we take this tack, we can reconnect faculty and students with library spaces through a chain of engagement and creativity. Um, we um, incubate emerging technologies, have enhanced hands-on learning and engagement, and with new kinds of creative pedagogy. And we really provide a platform for programs and workshops. So I think, um, ah, here we go. That's where I, what I should have done. And so um, what I'm going to do next is turn it over to Jason, who's going to talk about some of the examples of the types of learning spaces and projects that we've got. Um, and he's going to talk about some of the, the cool things that we're doing with these ideas. Thank you, Jill. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason evans Growth, and I'm the digital media librarian for the Learning Spaces and Services Department at NC State University Libraries. Um, I started at NC State uh, in 2013 as uh, a library's fellow, um, along with, I think, one of my library's fellow classmates is in here also. 
Um, and as a foundational standpoint, the, 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 fellows, the, the fellows program, I think, is a good place to start with, um, or, or at least a good example of some bedrock uh, that lays the foundation for all of, the, uh, all of these aspirations to be the experiential library. In that, when fellows come aboard, we're given time and resources and often projects that we wish could be done that haven't been done yet, and then given some time and resources to do those projects as if we're forging ahead, seeing if the stuff will work. And often, if not always, pretty often, um, those projects and work that the fellows do in that two-year appointment becomes a really big part of the library. So we're, we're, in, we're invested in this idea um, from the staff, which is where it's very, really important because that's who's doing the outreach in a lot of ways. Um, and, uh, and this is not just limited to fellows, of course. It's just one of the, uh, one of the things that comes out of this investment is that program. Um, so I think that uh, having staff on board with this idea of really becoming partners and building community and recognizing community and then showcasing it through, uh, through all the methods that we have at our disposal, um, it becomes a really a big driving force in making ours an experiential library. Um, you see in this example page uh, uh, just a few things that we'll go over later, um, not the least of which is that picture of Chewbacca next to a bodybuilder from 1893. All right, so let's talk about immersive pedagogy. Um, one of, that's one of our, uh, one of the things that we, I think people see a lot of pictures of, these giant video screens that we have at both of our libraries that we actually use to showcase student work and to engage with faculty and to create community programming. Um, you'll see on the top is an example um, from a class which with, I, uh, with which I worked, uh, English 585, Graduate uh, Studies in Film, that was all about female directors. That is a 20 foot wide screen that's available, to, that's easy to see as you walk in to Hunt Library. Um, 3,500 people or so pass it by every day, and the group of people, uh, most of the group of people watching this right now is the class as they're presenting their projects to each other about a single female director where they had to go into that person's uh, filmography, their biography, and create essentially a few things, a museum piece, a, uh, a, a moving image uh, look at all of the work that they had done, and then um, some still images that talk about the director and behind the scenes stuff too. So in this way, they've created something they can put on their CV. They're engaging community at the library in film history and the idea of feminism in, in film, for example. They have to write something that is viewable by the public. They can put this on their resume. They have to take workshops to learn how to make movies and they have to work with research librarians and digital media librarians to put it together. That's a lot of engagement in one project that then lives in one place that anyone can come and experience. So we have the story behind it and then it tells its own story. A couple of more examples below of just some engagement in immersive learning. There was an animation class in our teaching and visualization lab. Um, that's Dr. Matthew Booker on the right at the bottom talking about data and how it works with history and he looks dwarfed by the size of the uh, projection there, but he actually fits very well in, inside of it. Anyway, this is something that we've been working with in various forms forever. We learned it from museums, we learned it from grade schools, we learned it from PBS, and now we can make it more interactive by making these technologies a little more democratized. It really started with this thing, uh, our first big project, which, I'm, which we're still talking about, but I want to mention why we're talking about it now, is Virtual Paul's Cross. Maybe it's been mentioned at CNI before. The cool thing about this was it was taking uh, a very, uh, a, a classic work by, uh, and, and turning it into a 3D immersive world inside of a studio. I'm not gonna go into the details of it because you see it here, but we re recreated a cathedral uh, in 3D and uh, there was you know, actors reading the words of John Donne and all these uh, beautiful, uh, all these beautiful reenactments and it took a team of so many people who were all experts and a long time to make it happen. And it was super inspiring, but it was also a little overwhelming for people, faculty members and students to come in and say, if, if this is what is expected of me, I'm not sure I can live up to it. Well, they could, and we wanted to be able to give them the resources to do it. It didn't, never has to be this, but it can take the tenets of this and the tenets of this and make it their own, which I think really helped. People were coming into the library on their own to see this happen. We proved it could work that way. And then our job was to make it possible to do these kinds of projects with two people rather than like 20 and in Raleigh rather than internationally, although both are welcome there. So we started there and then we started branching out. In 2014, we, uh, Professor Marsha Gordon and myself worked with a graduate student class to take our video game lab, which also has a 20 foot wide and five foot tall touchscreen, or at least it did then, 
and turn it into a uh, video exposition room. The same way you might, the same thing you might find in a museum. Um, so her students were asked to build a three screen, simultaneously playing video project about American documentary filmmakers who experienced American conflicts. Uh, that's why they were shooting wars. Um, and to basically tell the story of a different American conflict. Um, and they were asked to do this in a way that we had never used the room before. They were asked to do it in a way that they'd never experienced before by actually finding all these primary source materials, editing them together, and building an interactive museum display inside of the library. Um, and then they had to be docents for it and advertise for it too. But I'm, I'm, I, we didn't check the audio, which was something that we probably should have. Classic digital media librarian move right there. But let's see what happens when a digital media librarian I'm going to play this because I think it's interesting to hear their voices. And when you can't hear their voices, I'm going to do this real quick. Wait a, one second, everyone. This is the other thing you learn is how to improvise. I'd, be, I'd love to sing you some lines from Hello Dolly for a moment as I reconnect this output to, may I have some uh, sound in the back, by the way? It looks like it is outputting by HDMI right now. So do we have the volume control up here? Oh, it's set to output. If they don't talk, we'll just watch them for a moment. Maybe I can pre pretend, or I, actually, you know what? It'll be even more fun if I just guess at what they're saying. Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah, perfect. So one of the things that we're also really concerned with is getting the voices of our community out there. And by that, I mean, like, hearing them talk about their experience is a little more interesting than hearing me say how great of an experience they had. At least I think. Let's find out. And you still can't hear them, so here's what they would say. That's, the, that's Jason Buell, who's talking about how they used the library to both build and conceive the project. That's Professor Gordon saying that she really wanted to do this kind of thing forever. This is an example of what it looked like, but imagine that 20 feet wide. So they had two moving images and text in the middle. Here Jason is saying, there we go. Let's try this again. All right, so this is important. Did you like what I did, though? Thanks. So the way the project was structured, we had three layered tracks. We had um, image, we had sound, and then we had text. And so it was a three-screen installation. Putting those three separate films together to have a simultaneous experience. This project really uh, opened my eyes to all the possibilities, especially in Hunt Library, not just for research in the traditional sense, but for uh, the places that research can go in the future. It took the standard toolbox and it just kind of you know, kicked it to a whole other level. It gave me a lot of appreciation for the hands-on aspect of teaching. You begin to understand a little bit more about what goes behind the making of meaning through media. That collaboration between students and librarians and faculty will define the People were going to see it outside of the class. It was for more than a grade. Things that might have once been tucked away in essays and journals can now get out much more easily, become sparks for discussion. Just think about the potential for this as the kind of project that can really give meaning to a 21st century library and to a 21st century classroom. It was a nice experience. So they do say it better, but I think that's what we're trying to get at here, is like using our resources to actually make something that gets out of the hands of the professor and into uh, the world at large. People have things to say. We respect our students and faculty. We want them to use the library as a venue, to use the library as a platform, to use the library as a canvas, and then we can create an experience and help collaborate on experiences to make that work too. Um, I'm just gonna show this because that moved down into this uh, where Professor Gordon then asked her undergraduate students to think about making movies using our technology lending program. This is them recreating the 1890 or 1894 Sando picture uh, that Thomas Edison Studios made. And in this short experience, the student makes comments about uh, misogyny, femininity, the female body, the male body, but also who, like many of our students have no idea that movies were being made in 1894, nor have they ever been asked to make a one-shot film 
And in this case, uh, in-camera editing. And so people walking past this not only see this, but they also see metadata about the class. Um, maybe they take that class, maybe they go to the Ask Us desk, which is what we call our front desk, and ask what camera they used or what kind of video editing software we can offer them, and then we can check that stuff out to them. That is an experience that we can't often just predict. That's an experience that happens. So we have to use serendipity and then thoughtful curation of student work to make this go. Um, we do this with physical spaces too. So we've afforded ourselves some physical spaces. These are some pictures from our experience in King Project. Dr. Victoria Gallagher, Dr. Jason Miller, and Kian Petaway put together um, after being inspired by finding a tape of Dr. King speaking in Rocky Mountain, uh, North Carolina, uh, an early version of speeches that we, we would then hear later, and then coming to Special Collections while I worked there, asking us if we could digitize it, finding out he couldn't at our library, but then getting it digitized by an NC State alum and coming back with the idea for this project I mean, the library was there the whole time, which I think is awesome. Uh, he, uh, he and Dr. Gallagher and Keon put together a whole day of events that involved walking tours, utilizing our big screens, and then human speakers analyzing this stuff for us. So that was physical, but then we also made some virtual experiences with this. Um, you can see a motion capture uh, suit uh, on the actor that portrayed Dr. King in one of our ex virtual experiences. Uh, you can see Dr. Derek Ham. For, uh, using a personal VR rig to experience uh, a, a, a rebuild of the church in which Dr. King spoke in North Carolina. So you can ex experience that with the original audio yourself. You can find out from that that we have a virtual reality studio at the library, and the library can also now help you digitize your quarter inch cassette tapes if you need it. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see the, the game lab, again, used in a different way as a game simulation for people to feel what it was like to be part of the civil rights movement. This allowed faculty to recreate the experience that students could engage with, um, bringing back something that was lost to history through the library, through technology, and through human engagement. Um, we were the platform. There were lots of kinds of modes used here, AR, VR, uh, uh, preservation of audio. Um, and we get to now spin this up. Unlike the St. Paul's Cross thing, we can actually recreate this in various modes. Uh, in various places because of VR, but if we want to bring the whole thing back up, we can, and we see about 800 people come through and experience this every semester now. So let's talk about other things. How do we, how do we get people to experience making? Well, makerspaces are helpful. You can see some examples of some of our early stuff. In our Hunt Library, we had a makerspace, we have a makerspace that's more of a service point, and, you, and uh, on the top right there, you see our jar with the twist pri uh, prototype. Some students decided to come up with a better way to get peanut butter out of a jar, and that's been displayed, that was prototyped in our makerspace on 3D printing when 3D printing was just at the burgeoning point of being all the rage. And that has lived in our technology showcase forever because it shows that convergence of idea to an actual product. Um, we have, uh, on, on the left here, we have the pulse dress with uh, Jocelyn McNeil. Um, and if Lauren's in here, I think she was helpful in making that happen too. But you know, wearable electronics in fashion, we are a design school, we're a textile school. How do we get these things to work together? And then after the service point was popular, we built a really hands-on one to democratize that, that, that stuff further. On the bottom, you see some examples of people during our makeathon, which pairs with the Office of Sustainability to help students think about how they can use their hands-on skills to make things in the maker world that helps with sustainability. I think making is more than 3D printing, as we all do, I'm sure, and I'm the media librarian. We've been making media forever, and we still don't know how. We still learn how to do it better every year. One of the first coolest projects, I think, that ever showed the library as an experiential platform for sharing and community was our My Hunt Library project, where we asked students to use Instagram to, show, to tell their story of our new library, and then we kept that stuff in our special collections, uh, which they were excited about. They were thrilled we were archiving that, which was a surprise to us, although it shouldn't be. I don't know why we're such a humble uh, group of people, but we are, and thankfully, I guess that's true. Uh, but anyway, we keep it, they like it, and then we show it back to them on that giant screen. To show you the size of that picture, the, the Contemporary American Females Director Pro Female Directors Project, which I mentioned before, is the same width on that 20-foot screen as all the pictures that were taken in Instagram. So it's telling people that you can do stuff even if you don't think you have the tools to do it, and we can help you figure that out. And we've moved that idea of collecting from our community and building it more to introduce them to each other through something called State of Sound, which I started to help uh, pioneer about a year ago with a really great team of media folk. State of Sound is that just that. We want to collect the state of sound making at NC State. We want to get podcasts and the music that gets made in our 11 audio and video recording studios. We want to 
partner with people like Moog on the right there and have uh, a Dial Tones event where, where I Am Jill here is improvising on a Moog workshop synthesizer and then we write programs to visualize what she's doing behind her. We, and you can see, see below an image of our, of, our, uh, of our music studios too. We wanna bridge disciplines by making people who maybe make music but don't think that they can make a program or uh, write in Python and have them find those two things in one place. Our make a is a good example of this. This group made a town out of paper that was controlled uh, that became a virtual environment by putting on a headset and connecting it to a GoPro. So while you're looking in 3D, you're actually seeing classic Walt Disney invented paper 3D uh, towns, crazy. Um, here you see uh, Lucas who's animating 3D structures um, based on sine waves. And I think that what we can say is that we've learned a lot from all of this, but we're driven now even more to showcase the amazing work because the more the ball gets rolling, the faster it goes. So we'll, I'll have Jill close this out, thank you. So you've seen uh, the kinds of things that we're working on in our library. Um, you know, obviously, we didn't get there overnight. Um, we have a lot of, we've faced a lot of challenges in getting to the point where we are. Um, some of those were an initial lack of awareness uh, of, the, of the kinds of services and the skills and abilities that we can offer. Whoops. Um, uh, clearly, um, once we start offering these kinds of things, we have an increase in demand. So how do we meet that demand? Um, we have to build up the staffing expertise and the capacity to support these kinds of new services that we want to offer. Um, and then we need to um, work to build these kinds of uh, activities that we're, that we're um, fostering in the libraries back into the classroom environment. So how do we do that? Um, we um, do that by taking advantage of the opportunities that are unique and beautiful environments, technology, um, staff expertise, and, um, and their skill in providing programming and workshop, workshops provide. So you know you can't just build a beautiful library and expect that people are going to just show up. Um, you have to draw users to your library and show them the possibilities to spark their imaginations. And I think you saw a lot of those um, examples with the kinds of projects that Jason um, uh, uh, talked about. We'll, we'll show some more examples uh, next. Um, so we do it with a, a rich portfolio of programs, exhibits, and events that drives greater usage, um, creates public engagement in the scholarship and impact of the university, and we've seen that uh, time and time again. Um, much like museums, libraries now should have a constant flow of programming um, that connect various communities and bridges students, faculty, alumni, and the community. Um, and if we do it really well, it adds to the diversity of the people and ideas who are engaging with the library. Um, and finally, uh, we um, want to offer a portfolio of workshops and trainings that move faster than the curriculum of the university is able to, to give students the latest skills and technical mastery to enhance their standing um, when they graduate and go off to seek uh, their new jobs. Um, I'm going to give some examples around data visualization um, in, in all of these areas and how we engage with this subject area um, in the libraries um, to further it for the campus. So first, we offer a wide slate of workshops in data, data visualization, data science. Um, these are some of the examples of the workshops that we've offered. Um, I think this was last year's slate of workshops, which is kind of an example. Um, uh, I want to quickly mention one of the ways that we're able to do this is by um, uh, the creation of the program called the Peer Scholars Program, where we recruit graduate students who have specialized skills that library staff do not have. So particular statistics um, expertise, um, law tech experience, and so on. Um, and we give them opportunities to, uh, to get paid to lead workshops for the library. Um, and it, it becomes a really great opportunity for them. They have a resume builder. We create nice headshots for them. We record their workshop sessions. We can offer um, kind of peer critiques of their, of their teaching ability. And then they have an online um, uh, example of their teaching to give uh, to show when they're um, on the job market and looking for looking for work when they graduate. Um, the Peer Scholars is one of the ways that we were able to, and just this is last year's um, workshop numbers in the library. Um, we were able to deliver um, over 400 workshops, reaching over 6,000 students for 545 hours of workshop training in all these different areas. Um, you can see we used uh, 33 librarians, six staff members, and 11 students to accomplish that. Um, in addition to, to workshops, we have uh, an active slate of programs that engage the community and bring people in. This is our coffee and Viz, this is a picture from one of our coffee and viz programs. It's one of our most successful um, public event series that we have ongoing in the library, where each month we bring in a faculty member to show off their work that they do in a wide variety of academic disciplines. Um, another example of a program, not necessarily in 
uh, data visualization, but we not just have um, faculty research, we also make a point of showing off undergraduate research in the libraries um, every, I think every semester. So. Um, at the end of the semester, we have our kind of undergraduate honors um, research slam, where the top research papers um, written by undergraduates are, um, those students have an opportunity to present their work in the libraries and, um, and share it with their peers. Um, another example of one of our most successful programs, uh, Jason already covered this, so I won't share a ton, but the Experiencing King program, where we just brought in thousands of people from the public to tour the library. Uh, it was a real event. It was a real, really moving um, event that brought a lot of goodwill, I think, from the community as well, and, and again, makes us recognized force, not just on campus, but in the community of Raleigh. Um, State of the Sciences is another really uh, cool example of uh, one of our really successful programs, um, public science outreach, where we invite people from the community to come in, um, and, it, and we have stations set up all over the library, um, different science-related topics of research that's happening at NC State. This is a group of students from the dance department who are um, acting out the movement of um, ions around, an, or electrons around a nucleus in an atom. Yes. So, right. It was cool. Um, do we have time to play this? How long is this? Know. What time is it? Let's find out. I don't know how phones work either. All right. Yeah, we have time. Um, okay. Let's see if I can get this to play. You know, the first time I talked to Susan, I, uh, Susan Nutter, I... I'll pause to provide a bit of a context. This is David Silver, a visiting facu faculty member from the University of San Francisco. University? Francisco. San Francisco State. Um, who... Um, who came to the Hunt Library when it was new to kind of show off his work in the space. And so this is his example of, uh, this is just a brief clip of him talking about why he wanted to come and the value he sees in, um, in a kind of library that does the kind of stuff we do. Is there any way I could come to the library to work with your video walls? I said that about two years ago. Last year I said something different. I said, is there any way I can come back to your library to work with your staff? Do you remember that? It's the staff that I'm after. This is a team collaboration. One of the things I've been really inspired about, about Hunt Library and about Hill Library, too, if you all haven't been to Hill Library, that's an that's a equally um, astonishing library, is that something about the librarians here and the administration have figured out that today's students do not work independently. They work in groups. And if you walk around this library, you'll see them working together. You'll see them moving the, the, um, the, the furniture. You'll see these once nice, tidy desks turn into these circles. And it kind of proves to us that today's students understand that collaboration is key. Just a couple more slides. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we grew capacity to be able to offer these kinds of experiences. Um, this is a kind of a cycle of like, I, I could spend probably 20 minutes, 30 minutes talking just about this. We don't have that much time, um, but it really kind of starts at the recruiting phase. Um, at, at an organizational level, um, when we recruit, we recruit for people who are curious, who, who um, uh, have an expectation that they're gonna continuously learn as part of their job. Um, then, crucially, once they get here, we give them the time and the resources they need to be able to develop those new skills, time to experiment, um, and it's not just lip service to the idea of trying new things. We really um, support that through a variety of means, um, including um, you know, funds to support new ideas through a, a program called the Good Ideas Grant. Um, then we, we build this organizational expertise, um, and we grow it um, by teaching each other how to do things. Um, we also provide formal learning and training opportunities. We do um, put a substantial amount of, amount, amount of um, time and resources into professional development opportunities. Um, we um, then provide, again, the opportunities for the, for the people who are learning these new skills to apply them, to engage and, and, and gain a sense of purpose and mastery of those skills. Uh, and then it's just kind of a cycle that goes around and around. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, this is the final slide. We've got a couple of times for questions. This is again that quote from Paul Fife about the library being um, uh, a platform to expand what, uh, what researchers' ideas of what's possible in a library and at a university are. So thank you.